an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fists. Our God is an awesome God. The Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you'd better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with grace. The darkness created the light, our God is an awesome God. Judgment and wrath he poured out of Sodom. Mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. Hope that we have not too quickly forgotten that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Hallelujah and welcome everyone. Just want to welcome you tonight to the Blaine Tent Revival. Uh, this is the first one that's ever been done. And I want to introduce. What's that? Praise the Lord. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I want to introduce myself in, in the worship team here. My name is Craig Dorney. I'm the associate pastor of Corner Fringe Ministries. This is Emily on guitar. She is our worship leader. And we have Anna on the keys, Amy on drums, Brett on bass, and Ken on keys here. And um, yes, very good. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> well, I want to just bring your attention to a few housekeeping things here uh, tonight. And I think, Dan, you have that slide up for me of the website. So at Blaine Tent Revival, Dot com. You'll see, if you scroll down on the page, you'll actually see that there's, there's this place where you can go and you can put your contact info and you can also check these boxes. And these boxes have to do with the various ministries that are here to support you uh, and to help you through whatever you might find yourself going through. And you're going to find in the back, we have several tables and the first table you'll find is Outpost Ministries, and this ministry specializes in, in walking you through an unwanted same-sex attraction or gender identity struggles, as well as, and along with, many other different uh, sexual uh, issues that pe many people are going through. You'll also find Life's Healing Choices, a table that, uh, there there's people actually manning this table. Their focus is freedom in Jesus from your hurts, your hang-ups, and your habits. You're going to find a discipleship table back there, and this is old-school, biblical, classical mentorship and discipleship, something that is really unheard of in the modern church. You're also going to find a Conquerors series, and that is specifically focused uh, and, and geared toward people who are struggling with a pornography addiction. You're also going to find a, a Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage marriage conference and seminar that's being put on. And also you'll find Anoka Community Mission back there as well. And so once we wrap up the revival, I just want you to know people are going to be back there able to answer your questions and walk you through uh, the, various, the various things you might need. And so I want to make that uh, very aware to you. And we're gathered here today in the name of Jesus Christ. We believe that we exist 
And we know that we exist for his glory and he's called us to live a life of honor to him. And so I want to ask you and invite you uh, to join with me as we pray for tonight's event. And we just invite Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit to be here with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just come before you and we exalt your holy name. Father, for us, this is so exciting. It's so exciting to be in a place where your glory dwells in this tent. Uh, it's, it's so symbolic of a temporary dwelling of even this life, this life that we live. And we know the truth of your word is this, that this tent at some point is going to wither up and fail. And Father, this, this part is gone and the next part comes. And so Jesus, we know that what is done in this life matters and it matters for you. So Jesus, I ask that you come tonight in a mighty way. I ask that you send your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you anoint this place and you fill this tent with your glory. Father, we come expecting to see you and to meet with you. Father, to see the hand of our King move and to exalt your name in praise and worship. And so we're here for you, Father, and we give you praise. We're humbled by your love for us. We're humbled by your sacrifice to take away our sins, to provide us with relationship with you. And we don't take that for granted. So Jesus, we pray that you draw near to us tonight as we draw near to you. And may your name be honored and glorified. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Hallelujah. I want to read a verse from Psalm 62. Psalm 62, verse 5 through 8. It reads this. My soul wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. On God my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Amen.
in our lives that are not right, that we need to surrender before you, Father. And we come before you saying, here we are. Here we are, our Lord Jesus. Please take me. Cleanse me. Take that coal. Purify me. Sanctify me. I am yours. And we look to you. We look to you tonight. In Jesus' name. of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow, invents the spear, and tells the wars to cease. O mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with
Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, we come before you and we know, Father, that you have broken every chain. There is no temptation that has overcome a man. It's what your word says, that you haven't defeated. And Jesus, we know that you know the weakness of our flesh. You know that you know every everything that we face and you are empathetic. Father, you're empathetic for what we go through, but Father, you've defeated it. You've literally broken every chain that has that has captured us, every chain that has has held us down. And Jesus, you break it. Your word says in Romans 8 that where your spirit is, there is liberty. And you you came, Father, giving your life, setting us free, creating an inheritance for yourself, adopting us into your family. And in doing so, you sealed us by your spirit and you broke the chains that held us from you. We know that sin separates us from you, Jesus. Thank you for coming and removing that certificate of debt in my name and breaking my chains. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now, Jesus, we can walk in newness of life, fixing our eyes on you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith, in a manner that is worthy of you. And so, Jesus, we ask tonight that you fill our hearts with faith and hope Father, give us strength and courage to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling as you you did and trusting yourself to the Father. And you left that example for us. As Pastor Daniel preaches tonight, Father, I pray that you speak through him in a mighty way. And I pray, Father, that you give us ears to hear your word, eyes to see your truth, and, Father, a heart willing to observe your ways and to surrender under your mighty hand. So we just we just praise you tonight, Father. We give you praise, Jesus. There's no, there's no one worthy of our glory and praise except for you. You are one. You are the one. So we lift up your name tonight. And we all say, Amen. Last night, if you were here, we talked about repentance and how repentance was fundamental. It's a pillar to ignite revival. In fact, the purest definition of revival is, in fact, repentance. Tonight, we're going to talk about another element equally as important as repentance, and it's something that has to do with breaking every chain. And that is the element of faith. We need faith. It is absolutely fundamentally critical for this to be successful, for us to get together and actually have real revival, not an emotional high, but a true revival. The Holy Spirit breaks out in power, in mercy, in forgiveness. For that to happen, we need faith. And so tonight, I'm going to effort to build into your faith. This is my strategy. I want to get to the end of tonight, and your faith is not the same as it is right now. This is so critical. And you think about it, the more faith that you have, the more power you will possess. The more faith that you have, the greater influence you will make, the greater impact you will have on the world. This is something we as believers, we need in spades. Now, I want to open up today. Oh, that was really sensitive. Good. That's a good sign. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, in hearing by the word of God. We're told how we can increase our faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The more of the word that we can sow into your hearts, the greater the faith. It's a very simple strategy. That's what we're going to do tonight. I am going to inundate you with passage after passage, mind-blowing passages to build your faith. If we have the faith 
of what Jesus talked about, even as a mustard seed. I'm going to tell you, you are going to do things that the world cannot do. You will experience things that the world will never experience. That entices me. I want that experience. I want to make the most out of this life. And the way to do that is to unlock faith. Embrace it. Have great faith. With that said, I want to open up with a thought tonight. And the thought is this. Did you know the only thing that mankind can possess in this entire universe that can provoke the Lord to awe. There's only one thing that makes the Lord of heaven and earth, the one who declares the end from the beginning, the one who holds all things together by the word of his power, there's only one thing that makes him marvel. You know what that is? Faith. It is faith. Now try to wrap your mind around that. How in the world can his creation make him marvel in any way? How can he be surprised? He knows what you're going to do before you do it. This is the point of prophecy. He prophesies of things that he tells us, the things to come, that when they happen, we may believe. How are we going to surprise him? How can we shock him to awe your faith? Let me take you to one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. Romans 8, verse 8, we read this. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Oh, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go. And he goes into another, come. And he comes into my servant, do this. And he does it. Absolutely amazing. So what's going on here? is this Roman centurion has asked Jesus to come and heal his servant. He needs to heal him. And Jesus is willing to physically go and heal his servant. He's like, no, no, you don't need to do that. This centurion understands the structure of authority. He gets it. He knows. He just simply gives the command and it gets done. This centurion knows Jesus has it. He knows Jesus has authority. He believes it. And so much so, you don't need to come to my house. You don't need to lay hands. Speak the word. It will be done. That is pretty amazing faith. In fact, listen to how Jesus responds. He says this in uh, verse 10. When Jesus heard it, what did he do? He marveled. And to those who followed us, surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even, oh, sorry. Sorry. Not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Okay, so look at this. This Roman centurion, he's not even a Jew. A Roman centurion moved Jesus, the Lord of heaven and earth, the one who eternally pre existed, the authentic Son of God, to marvel. How do we process this? I mean, when you really sit back and think about it, he moved him to marvel. I want to tell you something. You know, the first time I read this with this awareness, I was shocked. It didn't make sense to me because we can't, you can't make him marvel. You can't make him in awe. We're so small. We're so insignificant. Yes, you can. In fact, this is the grand prize for every one of us. I'm going to tell you right now, every one of us should have the desire to make Jesus marvel. What an awesome thought. Amen? If we display the kind of faith that this man displayed, you will unlock unlimited power. Unlimited power. Jesus is capable of anything. Faith is the access to him releasing that power. And in the process of your great faith, The bonus, the almost unbelievable thing is you can cause him to marvel. Now there's a flip side to the coin on this. And the flip side is found in the Gospel of Mark. And I want to take you there. Because this even gets more interesting. We read in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 6, Jesus, he comes. 
He actually is in his hometown of Nazareth. He goes to the synagogue on Shabbat on Sabbath. And he's teaching as he is accustomed to. But the people, his hometown people, are blown away. They're absolutely, who is this? Where did this man get this wisdom? And they were offended at him. They knew his family. It didn't make any sense. They're completely mystified. We know his father. Don't we not know his mother and his brothers are here? His sisters are among us? And they were offended. Well, listen to how this played out. And we read in Mark 6, 5. Now he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. Oh, and look at this. He marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages and the circuit teaching. The only thing that can provoke Jesus to marvel is either your faith or your unbelief. That is mind-blowing. This just makes faith the most important thing on my plate. This makes it the most interesting thing. This faith where we can cause the Son of God to marvel for good or we can do it for bad. Absolutely in unbelief. There's another component here I want you to recognize that takes some time to process. And that's right at the beginning of the verse. I've highlighted it. Now he could do no mighty work there. How do you process that? Everything, and I grew up in a Christian home, everything I've ever read in Scripture tells me Jesus can do anything, anywhere, anytime. He's unlimited power. And even still today, I confess that. But I had to actually read this in the Greek to believe it. He could do no mighty work there. He was prevented. He couldn't do it. That's like, your unbelief is the kryptonite. That's what it is. This is unreal. Our unbelief prevents the power of God moving. Why? Because unbelief, Jesus will not be glorified in our unbelief. Therefore, there is no power. No power at all. Oh, this tells me so much. This reveals so much. It's so frightening, but it reveals so much to me. Awesome thing to contemplate. Faith is the difference of whether we're going to be healed or whether we're going to be left in affliction. Faith is going to be the difference of whether you're set free or you stay in bondage. Faith is going to be the difference of whether you receive life or whether you end up in death. Faith the difference between whether this revival is successful or not. It's on us. It's on us. Do we believe? I want to take you to the 14th chapter of Matthew. We read this. We're going to build into this. Now in the fourth watch of the night... Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. Okay, the fourth watch, you're talking about 3 a.m., 4 a.m., maybe 5 a.m. in the morning. It's dark. Jesus is walking on the sea. Not normal. He's in the middle of the sea. And when his disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out with fear. Now you look at that in the Greek, Croswell, they screamed. We have grown men. Now keep in mind, these are rugged men. These are outdoors men. They're fishermen. These are not Romans, you know, reclining with their freshly pressed togas, sipping on who knows what, talking about politics and philosophy. These are real men, okay? And they're in the middle of the boat. And get the context here. They are screaming like little girls. They are terrified. To do that to these grown men, you know this is serious. Adrenaline is pumping. They are witnessing something not only that they have never seen before, they've never even read about. They've never heard about this. And that's saying something because the Jewish people, I just challenge you, look at their history. It's filled with miracles. The Lord parts the Red Sea. The entire nation goes across on dry land. Elijah's raising the dead. Elisha's raising the dead. Unbelievable miracle. Samson being recorded doing unbelievable exploits in war. They're not, uh, they're not unaccustomed to miracles, but they've never heard or seen anything like this in their life. 
And they're absolutely terrified. So this is the context. And we go on to verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. What? Okay, we're just coming off of, we, we think we saw ghosts, we're screaming in terror. The adrenaline is still pumping. Jesus lets them know, it is I. And the first thing that comes out of Peter's mouth, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. That makes no sense. Because the natural response is, Lord, if it's you, come into the boat. Come into the boat, be with us, please. Peter doesn't do that, does he? He doesn't do that. He does something men wouldn't even conceive. He actually says, I'm going to do something. He, he proposes, Lord, let me do something no other man in the world has done. What does this tell you about Peter? This is a man that is operating on a completely different level. He is not normal. This man has so much faith, it's mind-boggling. Notice none of the other disciples were petitioning such a request. None of them. Peter doesn't hesitate. You might want to take into consideration why the Lord used Peter in such a mighty way as he did. To the point where he had such an anointing, people are trying to walk into his shadow to be healed. Make no mistake, it's because this is Peter. This is his heart. He has faith. He doesn't even blink. This is an incredible thing. Peter's completely unique in every way. One thing that's worth mentioning, as we're looking at this scenario of Peter, the only one speaking up, Peter, the only one that's going to get out of the boat, do you know he was on the innermost sanctum of the faith? He was the closest to Jesus. Out of all the disciples, Peter, James, and John, they had backstage passes to very special events none of the other apostles were invited to. Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. Only Peter, James, and John were allowed to be there. Go to the Gospel of Mark, Jairus' daughter, she's dead. Jesus brings only Peter, James, and John into the room as he raises her from the dead. Peter is fascinating. Peter is a guy you want to pay close attention to. He was on the innermost sanctum, and there's a reason why he was that close. And you're looking at it on the screen. Command me to come to you on the water. Well, how does Jesus respond to this? In verse 29, we read, So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Are you serious? Peter's faith was so strong in Jesus, he doesn't hesitate. He doesn't even blink. Not for a moment. He immediately gets out of the boat. I wonder how many of you, if you were in that situation, immediately to get out of the boat, you start lifting your leg out and you're going to put the leg in the water. Don't tell me the thoughts wouldn't start flooding your mind. I am literally going to do something that no man has done before. What am I thinking? Am I, is this even going to work? What's going to happen? All these floods of doubt start flooding in. Peter doesn't have that. We need to look and see what a real man of faith is like. What he's made of. How he thinks his heart. He doesn't think like that at all. He just goes. There's no hesitation whatsoever. There is something else that I want to point out here, and it's probably the most critical point of the entire story. And listen to me carefully. The fact that Peter is getting out of the boat and walking on water, listen to me, he doesn't do it for the experience. Peter's not getting out of the boat so he has bragging rights so that he can boast that he has done what no man has done before. It's not even about, man, this is going to be awesome. I'm just going to experience the power of God. And this is going to be awesome. That is not what Peter is doing. That is not Peter's heart. The only thing Peter cares about is getting to Jesus. 
The only thing he cares about, Jesus is over there and I'm going to him. And I don't care if between the boat and him, it is impossible. No man can walk on water. Peter doesn't care. His heart is for Jesus. He is so focused. There's perfect clarity. I want Jesus and I don't care about anything else. We can learn such an important lesson now. Because there are people that go to revivals for the experience. They want the experience. They want to see the power of God. Show me the power of God. Where is the power of God? I want to see it. I'm going to tell you right now. We will never experience the things that Peter experienced until Jesus is the reason. Never. If we lose our focus, even for a moment, I mean, you're starting to pedal, you're starting to troll that line of tempting the Lord thy God. Satan, when he was in the wilderness with Jesus, knew he had great power. Oh, if you're the son of God, by all means, turn these stones into bread. You have the power to do it, just do it, just manifest it. That wasn't enough. He took him up to the seemingly high mountain or to the cliff, and said, listen, if you're the son of God, cast yourself over. Just do it, because you know your angels are going to give charge over you. Show me your power. This is what the enemy does. That's what he does. I am not interested in show just for the sake of seeing his power. Our hearts have to be melted. The only thing we must care about is Jesus, and when we do that, we're going to walk on water. We are going to do things that the world could only dream of. We need to have our focus. Our heart needs to be loving Jesus. We can't handle being away from him, so we'll get out of the boat. And we don't care how impossible it is. We're going to him. That's how real revivals burn with Holy Spirit. That's when things break out because it's not about manifesting power and all these things. No, it's we're crying out, Jesus, we need you. And we don't want anyone else, and we need to be with you. That's what this is about. And you know, let me say this. And I think this is important so you understand Peter's character. This is his pattern. This is Peter's life. In other words, go to the Gospel of John to the very last chapter in chapter 21. And what do we read? We read that Jesus is resurrected and he's making an appearance and he's on the shore, but all the disciples are out in the boats and they're fishing and Jesus yells out, do you have any food? And they're like, no, we've caught nothing. He says, yeah, throw the net on the other side. They couldn't even pull it in. And one of the disciples said, it is the Lord. The second, go read it, the second Peter heard that it was the Lord, he jumped out of the boat And God in the water, you know what's interesting? He didn't walk on water. He had to swim and run into shore. He only cared about Jesus. He knew he was on the shore. Guess what, where the other disciples were? They were in the boats. They waited for the boats to come in, and then they got out. But not Peter. He got out of the boat. Do you see his heart? Do you see how this works? If we have our hearts focused on Jesus, push everything aside, the manifestations, all that stuff, and we humble ourselves before him and love him as a husband, as a betrothed wife loves her husband, watch out. The power will come. Don't worry about that. Worry about Jesus. We are called to be Peters. We're called to get out of the boat, and I'm going to tell you this, we are called to keep his commandments. And for you to actually walk out and keep his word, you're going to have to walk on water. I'm going to tell you that. You're going to have to walk on water. Continuing on in this story, in uh, verse 30, we read this. But when Peter saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. Now, again, understand Peter's history. He's a seaman. He lives in the water. He knows what violent wind means. It could mean imminent death. Treacherous waters. And he sees it. And it's coming in. He takes his eyes off of Jesus. 
And what happens? He begins to think. Fear, doubt starts seeping into his heart. He starts looking at the potential trials, tribulations, the potential threat. And that threat got into his heart. And it was proving to be deadly. Proving to be deadly. It's faith that keeps him above water. It's doubt that brings him to the bottom. How many times in your life, let's get practical and real. How many times have you come up against the violent winds and when the waves come crashing in, the waves of life on you? And you have all these different trials and tribulations coming into your life. Again, your marriage is falling apart. You're in an impossible situation. Maybe your family unit's falling apart. Your finances are in a shambles. You're up against all these things. Medically, you've been diagnosed with something. And when the doctor starts talking to you, fear literally covers your body. It just seeps in. It is so demonic. And that happens. I want to ask you, how do you respond? How do you respond to that? Do you allow that fear and that doubt to soak into your heart? Because it's going to make a difference in your future. We are called to fight against that. This is why Paul says in Ephesians, he says this in Ephesians 6.14, Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, but above all, above all things, Take in the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Every time people start sowing death into you, speaking death over you, even unintentionally. They're not meaning to, but they're speaking. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And they're speaking death over you. And all that happens is you get this plague of fear, this plague of doubt. And it just creeps in. And it crushes you. You begin to crumble. And that doubt gets bigger and bigger. It starts to metastasize like a cancer. And you're not going to get any better. The devil knows this. He's setting you up. He is setting you up for the fall. Now, continuing the story, we're going to see what kind of man Peter really is. I mean, he's already done. He's already shown unparalleled faith. He's walked on water. He got out of the boat. He's walked on water. But now he is up against trials and tribulations. How does Peter, this great man of faith, respond in this situation? Matthew 14, 30, But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. Ah, what does he do? He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Is this or is this not protocol? Psalm 50, verse 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Peter is an authentic man of faith. It makes me twitch when I hear sermons about Peter, how he wasn't a man of faith. I'm just like, what story are you reading? Do you not see who this man is? He immediately, we're being taught a lesson. When we're up against these things, we go, Lord Jesus, you are the one that can save me. Save me. That's how we roll. That's how we're supposed to respond. The Bible is filled with examples. I mean, I could give you example after example where righteous men of God are put to the grill. And you know what? They call on the name of the Lord. And he saves them. We have to read these stories. Either you believe this or you don't. If you believe this, we should be titans of the faith. Lions. So how did this work for Peter? He's calling on the name of Jesus. We go to verse 31, and immediately... Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to them, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? And I'll highlight that. We're given a piece of information here that is important. Jesus shows why he began to sink. Unless there was any ambiguity, it was because of doubt. We have to know this. 
And what is the one thing that makes Jesus marvel? What prevents him from moving in power is unbelief. But fortunately, Peter does have faith. He calls out. He started to doubt. He started to have it seep in. But he got his faculties back. And he cried out to Jesus. And guess what? It worked. Crying out to Jesus, we will be saved. It's that simple. Continuing on to verse 32. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Yes, you are. This highlighted portion, pay close attention, because this is a significant part of the story. The story is, as Peter gets out of the boat, he walks on water, he starts to sink, cries out to Jesus. Jesus grabs him by the hand, lifts him up. Now here's the thing. Notice in this passage, when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Only after they got in the boat, meaning they had to traverse who knows how far, and the violent wind and the waves are crashing about, and Jesus is with him in the storm, all the way bringing him back to safety. And you think about this reality, he will never leave you nor forsake you. If Jesus is for us, who can be against us? Amen? Isaiah 41.10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I wish I had time to go off and tell you, but prophetically, literally, the right hand, the right arm of the Lord, in Hebrew, the Zoroah, the Zoroah of the Lord, it is Yeshua, it is Jesus. That's who it is. It's Jesus, the Son of God. And look at what it says. I will uphold you with my righteous Jesus. That's the truth. And I love what Jesus says and when you get into Matthew 28 at the end of it. And, and he's talking to his disciples and after his resurrection. He leaves them instructions. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Commanding them uh, to observe all the things I've instructed you. And then he says this, the last thing in Matthew, and lo, I am with you always. He will never leave us or forsake us. Again, we need to be Peters. We need to walk on water. If we're going to make it through this life, this is what it takes. Now, I want to take you to 2 Chronicles, and I want to share a story with you in regard to King Asa. It's a story of faith. This is a story that shows what happens when you have it, and when you don't. And this is what we read in 2 Chronicles 16.1. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might let none go out or come in to King Asa, or Asa king of Judah. Now, obviously, the kingdom is divided. There are two separate kingdoms at this time, the northern kingdom the southern kingdom, and they're not getting along. And here's the scary thing. Israel... Is they, they're, they're far stronger than Asa, okay? Asa is outgunned, he is outmatched. He knows he can't win this war. So what does Asa do? Does he call upon the Lord? He doesn't. You know what he does? He calls upon a pagan king, Ben-Hadad, to come and make an alliance and save him. He makes this alliance. Ben-Hadad comes to his rescue and they push back Israel. And it would seem that, you know what? Asa's thinking to himself, man, I took care of this problem. I solved this problem. And everything's okay now. Not so fast. Because then God sends Hanani the prophet to speak to Asa. And this is what we read in verse 7. And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Uh-oh. Asa. Now pay attention because how many times have we fallen into this? Asa let fear and doubt in. And he didn't follow protocol. He did not follow Peter's lead. 
He did not cry out to the Lord. And you know what happens when you don't do that? When you begin to trust in man? Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 17. um, There we go. 17 verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. Do you understand how deadly this is? When you turn your trust into man, you are putting yourself into a curse. There's no faith. You don't have faith in the Lord. Now, we don't want to admit it. So let me be the first to do it for you. I can tell you right now in my life, even as a believer, I have catered to fear and to doubt, and it has cost me. And it can cost us everything. We cannot afford to do this. We cannot afford to fall under curse. Things are not going to go well for you if you begin to put your trust in man and make flesh your strength. You're falling under a curse. And there's so many thousands of different examples I could give on a daily basis where we do this. It's horrible. Continuing on, the prophet Hanani is going to continue to rebuke Asa. And this is what we read. In 2 Chronicles 16, 8. Were the Ethiopians and the Luvim not a huge army with the very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. You want to, you want to really appreciate the weight of that statement? See, back in, in, in 2 Chronicles 14, an army of over a million men was coming against Asa. It was a joke. It was a slaughter. It was a complete slaughter. But that time, Asa did not respond the way he did this time. He did not make flesh his strength. He dropped to his knees and he cried out to the Lord and the Lord took him out. Faith unleashed unbelievable power. An impossible situation now became possible because of faith in the Lord. Now listen to what the prophet says next to Asa. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth To do what? To show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. This is one of the most critical passages in this entire book, let alone the Old Testament. Do you understand? Nothing has changed. The eyes of the Lord are combing through this tent now. The eyes of the Lord are combing through Blaine. They're combing through Minnesota and the entire United States. They're combing through... To look for those whose heart is loyal to him, who believe in him without doubt, who have the faith of Peter to get out of the boat, and all they care about is Jesus. They're coming through because he wants to show himself strong. He wants to carry great exploits out through you. But you need faith. Your heart needs to be loyal to him, and the Lord will use you. If you feel that the Lord is not using you and you just don't feel used by the Lord and you just don't see that power, you don't see things happening, you might want to consider your heart. You might want to look at your true measure of faith because the Lord is hungry for it. He is seeking for us. He's going across. Who will show? Whose heart is loyal? So I can glorify my name. And when he goes to glorify his name, it's going to be big. It's going to be huge. Hanani ends with this phrase. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on you have wars. Why? Because he fell into a curse. He trusted in man, made flesh his strength, and now he is cursed. Doubt comes at a horrific price tag. I love what Psalm 60 says. Give us help from trouble. For the help of man is useless. Through God we will do valiantly. It is he that will tread down our enemies. He alone. That needs to go on your wall. That needs to go on your fridge. One more thing I want to show you about Asa as we continue. Verse 12. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet and his malady was severe. Yet, in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. Now, again, you you need to appreciate something. This is the most terrifying aspect of what we're seeing right now. Asa, did you know Asa was a revivalist? 
That Asa stirred revival among his people, that he tore down all the pagan altars, he turned the hearts of the people back to the Lord their God, that's revival. Asa did what was good and right in the sight of the Lord, but in his latter years, something happened. He is not finishing the race as though only one will win that prize. He is turning to men. Now he's diseased and he's trusting in the physicians. This is where he's at. How does that work out for Asa? The next thing we read, so Asa rested with his fathers. He died. You trust in the physicians, the next thing you read, you're a dead man. Because you did not trust in the Lord. I mean, this is a lesson for us. I want to read to you just a quick story. A man visited a mental institution. And what we're about to read really serves as an important lesson. This is what we read. While attending in college, I visited a psychiatric institution with a group of students to observe various types of mental illness. The experience proved to be very disturbing. I remember one man who was called No Hope Carter. He was, his was a tragic case, a victim of venereal disease. He was going through the final stages when the brain is affected. Before he began to lose his mind, this man was told by the doctors that there was no known cure for him. No cure. He begged for one ray of light in his darkness, but had been told that the disease would run its inevitable course and end in death. Gradually, his brain deteriorated, and he became more and more despondent. When I saw him in his small barred room about two weeks before he died, he was pacing up and down in mental agony. His eyes stared blankly, and his face was drawn and ashen. Over and over, he muttered those two forlorn and faithful words, no hope, no hope. He said nothing else. These physicians so deafened to him. They told him there was no known cure, and the disease... It's going to run its inevitable course. And as a physician, you just look at all the medical data. Everybody who has you, you know what? It ran its course. You're going to die. This is what they spoke. Again, life and death is in the power of the tongue. How did that affect him? Pretty horribly. Literally, as he's going to his death, he's speaking, I have no hope. I have no hope. Total death being spoken. They're sowing death in it. Let me be clear on something. For us to say that there is no cure, that any disease is incurable, is to say Jesus hasn't risen from the dead. That's what it's to say. For us, there is no such thing as incurable disease. Jesus is all-powerful. He is not limited in his power. You know what the only incurable disease is? Doubt. Doubt. It will prevent his power from moving among us. Do not let it in. Do not let it in. When the doctor starts speaking to you, and you didn't know you had cancer, you didn't know you had this, or you didn't know you had that, and they tell you, you know what, well, we'll just do the best we can for you. We'll make you as comfortable as you can. Don't give in to it. Jesus is alive. Believe. I want to take you to the Gospel of Mark, and I want to show you the beauty of Jesus, the power of Jesus. In Mark 9.21, we have a situation of an epileptic. And Jesus asked his father, how long has he been happening to him? And he said, from childhood... And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. Oh, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Read, look at that. If you can do anything. I'm going to say it again because you're going to need it. If you can do anything. Well, how does Jesus respond? He responds this way. If you can believe. If you can believe. Jesus put it on him. The man comes to him and says, hey man, if you got the power, help me out. He's like, no, 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 stop. 
do you believe? Pay attention, because Jesus is putting this on us. If you believe. And then he says, all things are possible to him who believes. Nothing is incurable. No situation that you say is impossible. No, it is not impossible. It is not. So how does the father respond to Jesus' statement? And this is what he said. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. It's a beautiful statement. He begins with, I do believe. Man, but if there's a shred of unbelief, help it. Do you know the apostles asked Jesus for the same thing? Lord, Luke 17, Lord, increase my faith. We want more faith. You know why? Because they knew where the power was. They knew where the power was. The power lies in our faith in Jesus Christ. Period. Moving forward to the Gospel of Luke. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. 12 years this woman has been afflicted and she has seen every doctor possible and she is left penniless. All her savings, everything she had is given to the doctors. I want you to think about the reality of that and what that would do to your psyche. What would this do to your faith? Year one goes by, you've been trying immediately, you're trying to do this, you're seeing this doctor, and this doctor says, this might look promising. I guess not. Two, three years go by, you see another couple doctors, this doctor says, oh, this, this, you know, I think I can work with you. I think I got something. This woman gets her hopes up. I think there's hope here. Only to find out, I'm sorry, we can't do anything for you. Year four, year five, year six goes by. Same thing happened again. She has hope. She's looking. Can you help? I thought we could, but we can't help you. What does that do to you? How would you fare in that? This is 12 years of affliction, and no one can help her, and she's got nothing left. Would you have any faith left? Well, here's what's amazing about this woman. Despite all the failures she had, she heard about Jesus, and she knew he had the power to heal her. She knew it. She believed it so much, she said in her own heart, all I need to do is go forth and touch his garment. That's all I have to do. And I will be healed after all these failures, after everybody got her hopes up and then dashed him to pieces. She didn't even doubt. So what happens? We go to verse 44. She came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. Exactly what she believed in her heart, that is exactly what happened. And we move on. Verse 45, and Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude throng and press you? And you say, who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power from going out from me. Now, we're given critical information in this passage. Jesus is in the midst of the crowd, and everyone is touching him. Everyone is brushing up on him, but guess what? No power is leaving Think about this for a second. All these people touching him and no power is coming out of his body. And yet the only one that touches him in faith, all of a sudden the power is released. This is on us. Faith is on us. The measure of power that we experience is the measure of our faith. If we are not experiencing power, you need faith. You need to increase it. Spend more time in the word. Pray, Lord, increase my faith. We need this. Moving on, verse 47. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. What? Your faith has made you well. He put it on her. You received this healing because you believed in me. You believed in my authority. You believed in my power. You believed in my compassion, my mercy. I'm going to give you one more example. Going to Matthew 9:27, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him. 
crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? He puts it on them. He doesn't heal them. He says, Do you believe I can do this? And they said, Yes, Lord. They said, Yes. So what's he do? Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. According to your faith. This is a bumper sticker. Again, this goes on our fridge. This needs to go in our heart. It is according to our faith. The way you walk in power every single day is according to your faith. Let it be to you. And for some of us, this is very frightening. I'm going to invite the the music team to come back up, and I'm going to close with this passage. In 1 John 5, 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Our victory is faith. You know what Jesus says is so frightening? He says in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 18, When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Will he? And that statement, it's, it's much bigger than you might anticipate because as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be a generation of faithlessness. And there's going to be a remnant and they're going to stick out and they're going to be men and women of power. Men and women of power. You guys, whatever is hindering you, Whatever is breaking your faith, whatever is sowing fear and doubt into you, you cut it off. When people are speaking death into your life, cut it off. Do not receive it. Rebuke it. When the doctor tells you, I'm sorry you have an incurable disease, I say, I'm sorry, doctor, you don't know Jesus. There is no incurable disease. I'm just going to, I'm going to close in prayer. And we're going to have the worship team do a song. And as they play, if you need prayer, you need to come forward. If you need to repent, you need to come forward. You need your sins forgiven. You need to come forward. If you need to confess that you have been faithless, despite him being faithful, you need to come forward. We need to get right. We need to get radical for Jesus. We need to seek. If there's things in your life you have been seeking more than Jesus, get it right tonight. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When the fathers tested me and tried me, though they saw my work, this is the day to do this. So as the worship team gets into worship, I just invite you down. Abba, Father, we give you praise and glory for sending your Son, Jesus, the Messiah, in whom there is life, there is forgiveness, there is hope, there is power, there is healing, there is redemption. I say these words because I believe them. I confess it. Lord, I pray that you increase these people's faith, Lord, more than a mustard seed, so that they can speak to the mulberry tree to be ripped out by the roots and to be planted into the sea, and it would obey him. But not just to display power for power, but only for your glory. Only to glorify your name, Lord. We ought not to look for the manifestations and power, but we need is to love you, to seek ye first, you. I pray this happens, Lord. I pray the people that need to get right with you tonight make it happen. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
103. It says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits. I read this and I think, I have forgotten some of His benefits at various times in my life. Verse 3 says, Who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is, is renewed like the eagle. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you redeem the years that many of us have lost because of a lack of faith because we haven't put our trust in you we haven't run to you instead we've stayed in the boat or worse yet we never even got in the boat and Jesus I pray that you forgive us for a lack of faith I pray Father that you do crown us with your loving kindness and compassion Jesus, I desire that. I desire the good things that you bring. Jesus, please for, forgive me for forgetting your benefits, for not walking with you, for being harsh and crude. Father, for not running to you for the healing of my diseases. that only words that are good for edification according to the need of the moment will proceed from our mouths so that those who hear it will receive grace. that we've oftentimes acted out of our own selfishness. And we're reminded of what your word says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. It says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus, please forgive us for that. Give us for the times we've acted selfishly, not considering those around us. 
not being loyal to what you've called us to be. Jesus, I know that there's some in here that have struggled in a very real way with loving their spouse, forgiving their spouse, and even, Father, forgiving themselves. And I ask and pray, Father, that you remove the fear from within them. And if you can forgive and deliver King Manasseh, Jesus, you can heal and forgive each one of us. If you can, because King Asa went before you and and pleaded the case of the million-man army coming for him, and by your mighty hand you delivered him, you can deliver us. If King David could act so wickedly in your sight, and yet, when he repented, you received him. Jesus, you will receive us. But we, we need to repent. And so, Jesus, I pray that as, as people are hurting because they, aren't, they haven't forgiven themselves, they haven't accepted your forgiveness, and they're held under the bondage of, of the lie of fear, Jesus, I pray that you cast that out that you remove that from them bring about joy and healing and the truth of your word Jesus it's you by your word that we live man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from your mouth hallelujah Father, there's many people that take and do not give. And your principle is, it's better to give than to receive. And you actually label this in your word. You label this as theft, as stealing. And Jesus, I just pray for conviction in this area that you move. There may be some here tonight that have stolen, that have have gone out and, and used the system evil way and have actually taken away something that wasn't actually yours or theirs. And so Jesus, I pray that that you bring them to yourself and that you set them free and may they be encouraged to make it right, which is right in your sight. And that brings honor to them and it glorifies your name.
Apostle John, the one whom Jesus loved, is recorded in the Gospel of John. In 1 John chapter 4, he wrote this. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this, love is perfected in us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. faith keeps us above the water and our doubt and our fear when we take our eyes off of you we sink and it's happened time and time again father i want to pray for anyone who is struggling with unbelief tonight anyone who is battling fear in the name of jesus i i just pray his love over you that his love his perfect love would cast out all of your fear Fear does not own you. Fear is not your master. In fact, the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6, Paul says that sin cannot be master over you. And when we fear, we run to men, as King Asa did. We run to what is not you, but your perfect love casts that out. And so, Jesus, I just pray over this this community tonight, your perfect love which casts out all fear. And I pray tonight that your peace that surpasses all understanding, as fear is confessed and faith is increased, I pray that your peace would fall over this body in a mighty way and your people would be encouraged and they would come to you, they would return to you, They would cry out to you. And Father, you would heal their diseases. You would heal them. And you would clothe them with your your crowns. And you would bless them. And you would minister to them like only you can. of your name in all the earth. There's no one like you. There's no one like you. Hallelujah. prayer for tonight as 
we leave, as we meditate on our lives and our faith and how we're living, let this be our prayer. Joy, my King. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound. May it be. May it be a sweet. that you are marveled at our pursuit of you. There's so many things to be said about just how amazing you are, even in our own lives. As I say that, Jesus, I recognize that if you're marveled by me, it's only because of what you first have done for me that I would be anything pleasing to you. Because as your word says in 1 John 4, 19, we love because you first, Jesus, you first loved us. And we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for loving us, for casting out our fear, for giving us faith, again, for healing our diseases, for giving us the path to walk in that is life and truth and 
honoring to our Father, our Father in heaven. So Jesus, we love you. And may our lives be a sweet, sweet sound before you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. as long as you want. Um, you're welcome to leave if that's what you want to do. If you need prayer, our prayer team is still here. And so we just want to thank you guys for coming tonight. Bless you in the name of Jesus.